Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Lift your Bible in the air. Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible Word. I am what it says I am, I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and don't know the things that have happened there in the last days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Father, I pray today for an anointing over your word. God, it's your word, and God, I pray that it will all be your word. Father, there are things that we need to gathered together in these final days. Lord, as we watch the news and we see the things that's happening around our world, God, we know deep in our heart that there isn't a lot of time left, that this world is is just getting further and further and further from you. People are becoming more confused and more rebellious, and, and God's sin is more blatant and open than it's ever been. And Father, we as Christians, we as part of your family, God, if ever we ever needed to, we need to today, to be as Christ-like as we possibly can. Father, we need to be beacons in the darkness of the world where people can look at us and they can find Christ. So God, whatever we need to do to put our lives in order, God, I pray that we will consider this as serious business. And God, that we will do that so that we walk uprightly and we walk righteously. God, that we can rescue the perishing and care for the dying. And God, do the work of your kingdom before the trumpet sounds. Honor your word today to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Has anybody ever told you that you look like somebody? Really? Who? Who you look like? Anybody look like a movie star? Not in your own mind. I mean, to other people. <laughs> Have you everybody, has anybody ever said to you, wow, you look just like your dad? <laughs> or, you look just like your mother? We had a picture of Jimmy. It was a picture of Lisa, actually, when she was, we were first married. And somebody looked at it, and that was back when Jimmy had the hair, you know. And swore up and down that it was Jimmy in the picture, you know. So then he cut his hair. Um, <laughs> he looked way too much like his mother, see. <laughs> now, how does that make you feel? Somebody say, you, you look like your dad, you look like your mom. How does that make you feel? If you think your mom and dad are good looking, then you might view that as a compliment. But if you've ever looked at your parents and prayed to God that you were adopted, You might see it as an insult. We have a tendency to resemble those that we have been born of. 
our chemical makeup, our genes, all of which are carried in our blood, is the product of our biological mom and dad. That's why we might not only look like our parents, but we might also sound like them and speak like them and walk like they walk. If your parents were athletic, you might have inherited their athletic ability. If they were musical, you might have inherited their musical talent. On the other hand, if they are obese and bald and have a lazy eye and elephant ears and a nose like a hawk, you might be a little depressed right now. Have you ever looked in the mirror and saw the face of your parents looking back at you? I'm getting older now. Things are turning gray. I get out of a chair and I walk like my dad. With the back, you knew my dad. I get out of the chair and I'm walking like my dad. I will look in the mirror some mornings and I will see my dad's face looking back at me. That is a creepy thing. I love my dad, but, but that, you know, that's how, I always thought my dad was old. I mean, ever since I was born, my dad was old. And now I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm seeing that look at back at me. The word Christian means Christ-like. Most all of us, when we speak of our faith in God, refer to ourselves as a Christian. We've been born of God by the blood of Jesus Christ, and now we are in God's family. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ uh, to all that our Father has. But I want to ask you, has anyone ever mistaken you for Jesus? You can't call yourself a child of God and not live every day for God. You can't live for yourself but still tell everybody that you've surrendered your life to him. You can't deny uh, his direct commands and claim to be in his will. And you can't live in rebellion and claim his blessing. If you're going to be God's child, then you're going to have to look and act like you are God's child. You can't be lazy in service. God won't let you lay around his house while everybody else is working on his kingdom. He won't let you deny him and sin in his face and talk back to him and resist his rules. He's not going to let you live like the world and act like the world and look like the world and still live under his roof. But if you're going to be a child of God, there must be a family resemblance. You must resemble Jesus so that the people around you will know that you belong to him. There must be a family resemblance and a family commitment to the family mission so you can live in unity with the Holy Spirit and your Heavenly Father can bless you in the things that you do. Lisa's oldest brother, Russ, has had long hair and a beard for the last 40 years. He lives in Florida, so we, didn't, we don't get to see him real often. So growing up, other than the occasional visit, our kids only knew their Uncle Russ by looking at family photos. When Jimmy was little, he was looking at some of our vacation pictures where we had been at Russ's house, and he was only about five years old. And like you do with, with young kids in pictures, sometimes you, you go through the picture and say, now who's that, and who's that? And we went through the picture, and we say, now who's that, Jimmy? Well, that, that's Mommy. You know, who's that? That's, that's Daddy. Who's that? That's Mandy. And then we asked, we pointed to Uncle Russ. <laughs> and he paused. He said, who's that? He paused, and then he got this big beaming smile on his face, and he said, that's Jesus. <laughs> now, too many of you get a family picture with Jesus, do you? <laughs> we probably should tell you differently. That was your Uncle Russ. That was, <laughs> we were just waiting for the right moment. When you truly become a Christian, the evidence of your change is made visible in your nature. You crucify the old nature, the man or the woman that you used to be, with all of his sins and all of his flaws and all of his bad habits. You put him to death. You hang him on the cross of Christ. And when, then once the old nature has been crucified, you take that dead man off of you and you put him in the grave. You put him in the grave and then you put on the new nature of Jesus Christ. How many of you know we've not arrived yet? We've not arrived yet. How many of you know that God has more for you than you have right now? How many of you know that you have to give to God more than what you've already given? How many of you know that there's still a closer walk and a deeper commitment and a holier life than where you are right now? We've not yet arrived. It doesn't matter how many years you've been saved and how many years you've been in church. There is none of us yet that anybody uh, confuses with Jesus. 
And that means we have a long way to go. There are some people today who go by the title of Christian who live their lives nowhere near where Christians ought to live. And yet still, they call themselves a Christian. They say that Jesus is their Savior, that heaven is their eternal home. They lay claim, claim to the benefits of the Bible. But what they profess is in direct contrast to the way to what they resemble. I've explained to you on more than a few occasions the process of the tabernacle. I really hope that all of my teaching sinks into you someday. I don't believe there's a church on the planet that's been more versed in the tabernacle than this one. In Old Testament times, the tabernacle was where the presence of God dwelt among his people. But when we picture the tabernacle, we typically see this great walled-in area with an outside eastern gate. But what we may not understand is the tabernacle was the small structure, just 45 feet long and 15 feet wide, that sat inside of those outer walls. And the abode of God was in a little 15 by 15 room inside of that structure. Now, there were tens of thousands of people who passed by the outside, and they could see the Shekinah glory of God resting above the holiest place. There were multitudes of people who entered in through the eastern gate and into the outer court, into the gathering area. There were many who, while they were there, sacrificed at the brazen altar. There were many who cleansed at the labor. There was a select group who even made it inside uh, into the holy place. But only one man was permitted to enter into the holiest place, into the presence of God. And that was just one time per year. Only one man made it into this holy place, that 15 by 15 room where the presence of God was. There was a veil that separated the holiest place from the rest of the tabernacle. But the Bible explains to us that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the veil that separated the holiest place from the outside was torn from the top to the bottom, as though it was torn by the hand of God. Opening a path into the mercy seat, into that holiest place for everyone, so that whosoever will could come into the presence of God. That's a great work. How far is far enough? How far do we really have to go? How close to God do we really need to get? How near to him do, do we need to come? How much more like him do we really have to be? I told the church Wednesday night about my concern for the people of this congregation. I, I want you to know the truth. I want you to hear my heart here. I want you to be sure of your salvation. I don't want any member of this church to stand before the judgment of God thinking that they're saved when all of the time, all they have ever been was religious. I don't want you to be conned into believing that attending church or acting out a ritual or making a trip down to the altar once is sufficient. I'm trying to rescue you from an eternal hell. You may not always like what you hear, and you, it may not be what you always want to hear, but I guarantee you that it will always be the truth of God's word. And it will not be a message that the Lord has not, has given me, hasn't given me. Because I care about your soul. Sometimes more than you do. But I care about your soul. I want to make sure you know the truth and you know how to live. That you know what the Bible tells you. Some of you here today are religious. You're faithful to the program. You come to church. You sing the songs. You volunteer for the jobs. You live a decent lifestyle. You've done a real good job on the outside. But there's never been a change in your nature. Salvation is a life-shattering experience. If you met the President of the United States, you would remember the time and the place that it happened. Some of you more than others. If you met some famous movie star, you would remember where you were and what you were wearing at the time. If you met some famous sports star, you would recall how you felt at that moment in time. So it would only stand to reason that if you met the great Jehovah God, the Savior of your soul, it would be a life-shattering experience. In our text, there were two men walking the road to Emmaus. One man's name was Cleopas. We really don't know him. He wasn't famous. He didn't hold a high office. We're not exactly sure who he was. 
There was a Cleopas mentioned in John 19, who was the husband of one of the Marys, but there was another Cleopas mentioned in ancient literature who's also called Alphaeus, but we really don't know for sure who Cleopas was. He just had a name. The other man that Cleopas was with was less identifiable than he was. The Bible doesn't even mention him by name. So it's just Cleopas and the other guy. Can't wait to get to heaven someday and meet the other guy. These two men weren't any of the 11 disciples. They weren't among those who went to the tomb at the resurrection, but they were just two guys who had been in the mix. They had hung out with those who followed Christ. I wonder this morning, how much in the mix are you? Do people at church recognize who you are? Do they know you by name, know what you do for a living, know where you live? Or are you in and out so fast and so uninvolved that people just refer to you as that guy or that woman? These two men thought that they were disciples. They thought that they were committed. They thought that they were true believers. But the truth is they were never who they believed themselves to be. You see, you can hang out at the gym but it doesn't make you an athlete. Any more than standing in the car makes you a garage or being in the barn makes you a cow. Don't be deceived. Don't base your eternal life or death, miss heaven or risk hell on anything other than the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't chance eternity on anything less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. God will arrange moments in your life that will expose to you where you stand. We're not going to walk into eternity and stand before the judgment of God and say, you know, God, I didn't know about that. Uh, Nobody informed me. I wasn't told. I I didn't have enough information. Because God will arrange moments in our life. God is fair if he's nothing else. He will arrange moments in our life where he will bring us face-to-face with ourselves and allow us to see ourselves as we truly are, to get a true image. (coughs) Excuse me of our nature. Have you ever passed a store in the mall that had a big mirror on the outside? I don't tell you the truth, I don't like stores that have anything on the outside. Every time I go past that, does this, I don't know if this happened to you or not, every time I go past that, that GNC store or whatever that's got the scales, it talks to me. <laughs> have you checked your weight today? It don't matter if I'm coming or going. You know, that dumb machine always asks me if I check my weight today. I'm starting to get to place. I'm old enough. I'm starting to answer it back now. No, I haven't, and I don't care. Oh. <laughs> but you walk past one of these stores at the mall, and they have these big mirrors on the outside. They kind of catch you off guard. You're walking along, minding your own business, feeling pretty good, and then you pass by this image, and you catch sight of it with your peripheral vision. And you stop. How many of you have done that? You know what I'm talking about. How many of you have backed up to take a better look? It'll ruin your day sometimes. That outfit you put on at home that you thought looked so good has suddenly been exposed to the bright lights of the mall, and you get to see yourself like everybody else has been looking at you all day. Woof. God will arrange some mirrors for you and me to pass by that will reveal to us what he has been seeing all along. When he does, you have two choices. You can either continue along your merry way and do nothing about it, or you can take a good look in the mirror and deal with what you see. Now, we're a little bit stubborn. We're a little bit stubborn. You know, we don't like to change things about ourselves. We've got this opinion of ourselves. We've got this image of self. I look pretty good. I look pretty good. But then we stand before the mirror for honest with what we see. You see, we need a mirror to fix our problems, right? If we got up in the morning and we got ready and we didn't use a mirror, we wouldn't know that there is something that's not right here. And so God will show us ourselves, and we can either deal with what we see or we can continue on and do nothing about it. Sometimes those mirrors come in the form of a tragedy. The true test of our faith isn't when things are going well, but the real test comes when it appears that all might be lost, that God is doing nothing, that Bible has been a lie, and that Christianity is just another worthless religion. When facing a crisis of our faith, when it appears that the system has failed us, that prayers haven't been answered, the promises haven't been fulfilled, and all hope is lost, some people choose to just walk away. 
Their true nature is revealed, but they refuse to deal with what God has shown them. These two men had been in the mix. They were likely in the audience when Jesus had fed the 5,000. They were probably there when he had healed the sick and raised Lazarus from the grave. They had seen Jesus' power. They had heard his words and his teachings. But now something had gone drastically wrong. Jesus had been betrayed. He was condemned. He was beaten and crucified and buried. It was a done deal as far as anybody was concerned. It was all over. So these two men walked away. They quit. It was fun while it lasted, the miracles, the healing, the large crowds, the times of rejoicing and celebrating, but now it was finished. Jesus was dead. He was gone. His body was buried. So that was it, and they walked away. Work hard for what you get, and get what you work hard for. Don't settle. Don't compromise, don't quit when the going gets tough, but get a stick to in you that wheels you forward when the easiest thing in the world for you to do is just quit and walk away. We live in a nation filled with quitters. We don't like our job, we quit, get another one. Don't like our husband or our wife, we quit on our marriage and look for another mate. We don't like something in our church, we slip away in the middle of the night to find another one. We've forgotten the old adage, When the going gets tough, the tough get going. When things get difficult, we have been conditioned by our world to simply quit and walk away. There will always be challenges of your faith. There will be times when it's not so easy. There will be times when it's not fun. There will be times when it's not rewarding. But if you walk by faith, you're not listening. But if you walk by faith and not by sight, you will soon understand that God is working on you to perfect in you the nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus had promised that on the third day he would rise again from the grave. His promise to rise again was so well known that the enemies posted guard on his graves. So we know that those who followed him were aware of it. But if that was the case... If Jesus promised to rise again on the third day, and it was the third day now, then where were these two men going? Evidently, what Jesus said didn't matter. Do you remember what I said last Sunday? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is the Bible just another book to you, or is it the Holy Word of God? Is it a mere suggestion as to how you should live your life, or is it God's law for how to live? Do you follow with what you agree with and what's easy for you, or do you strive daily to live by the letter of what God has said, no matter how difficult at times it might be? Jesus said, on the third day, I will rise again. But on the third day, these two men walked away. Verse 13 says, on the same day. On the same day that Jesus said he would arise, on the same day that he said he would get up out of the grave, on the same day that they would go to the tomb and find it empty, on the same day these two men left. One thing that always amazes me are the people who pay a lot of money to go watch a ball game or a race or a show, who get up in the final minutes and leave so they can beat the traffic out of the parking lot. That has never made sense to me. We're often very swift to quit on God. Most of us give him an hour or two on Sunday morning to do his thing. We're never deep in prayer. We're never immersed in his word. We never seek communion with him. But let him not respond to us in a timely manner, and we'll get up and walk away. Our standard of dealing with God is often more rigid than it is with anyone or anything else. We've tolerated our lazy, drunken husband for years. We've endured our nagging millstone of a wife for years. We've put up with our disrespectful uh, prodigal children for years, paid them off and bailed them out. we put up with our obnoxious friends and our idiot relatives and our strange neighbors, our in-laws and our outlaws, but let God seem to slip up just one time and we're out of here. On the same day Jesus promised to rise, they left. They walked out on all that they had claimed to have. 
They had been in the mix. They had been involved. They had been counted among the faithful. They ate when Jesus had fed the 5,000. They cheered when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They put their coach in his path when he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. But when he was crucified, when the going got rough, when the party was over, when the enemy attacked and the kingdom of God needed them the most, when it was their turn to give and their turn to work and their turn to stand, they bailed out and walked away. They liked the benefits that Jesus gave, but they weren't about to die for them. They liked the freedom that he offered, but it wasn't worth their life. So let somebody else sacrifice. Let somebody else give. Uh, let somebody else take a stand. And then if by chance it all works out, we'll just come waltzing back in and brag to everybody, look at what we've done. If you're not willing to take a bullet, then don't show up later to take a bow. In difficult times, some people leave God. They leave the church and they walk away from their Christianity. Walking away is the unmistakable evidence of your true nature. When you quit something and abandon the work, you're exposing your true heart. The trouble is, you don't want the blame. You don't want the blame. You don't want to admit that the real problem is just you your cantankerous spirit, your bad attitude, your self-centered agenda. So you start to complain and criticize. Somebody's hurt your feelings. Somebody's made you angry. Somebody's let you down. And you're walking away. You're just not going to handle it no more. You're going to find somewhere that you can be appreciated and somewhere that you can be more comfortable. You have an excuse. And you're quick to share it with anybody who will listen because you want them to know that the problem isn't you. It's somebody else's fault. When facing a difficult time, the move that you make sheds great light on the truth of your situation. These two men left Jerusalem and they set out for Emmaus. They walked away from spiritual things and they turned toward worldly things. They turned their back on the Spirit of God and began to listen to the old man of the flesh. Emmaus was a little over seven miles away from Jerusalem. It was known for its hot baths. It was, Emmaus was like a spa town. It was a good place to relax and create your troubles. And so they were going to go to Emmaus, and they were going to sit in a hot tub, and they were going to soak the Jesus part of their life away. When we turn from spiritual things, we always turn in the direction of worldly things. When we turn our back on God, we always turn our, our, our face towards sin. We no longer sow in the Spirit into the eternal works, but we begin to sow into our flesh, our old nature. We begin to hoard our money and our time. We buy for ourselves and we forget about other people. We take care of number one. We become greedy and self-centered. Nothing like Jesus Christ. These two men went in another direction. You've heard people say, I'm just going in a different direction. Going to try something new. The disciples were still in Jerusalem. The believing women who had came back from the grave and said that it was empty and the angels had told them he had risen were still in Jerusalem. The heart of the church was still in Jerusalem. The war was still being fought in Jerusalem. The ministry and the mission and the work was still in Jerusalem. The family of God was still in Jerusalem. But these two men walked away from absolutely everything. 1 John 2 says, this is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. Because if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going revealed that none of them belonged to us. The Word of God promises that in the end times, the persecution of the enemy on God's church will be so great that some will walk away. Verse 15 says Jesus walked with them. You may walk away from God, but he'll never walk away from you. He won't chase you down and beg you to come back, but the Spirit of God will come near you from time to time and give you the opportunity to change your direction. Verse 16 says that they were kept from recognizing. Mark 16 says Jesus appeared to them, but in a different form. Needless to say, they didn't know who he was. God might not always reveal himself to you. He might appear in your rebellion in a different form. He might show up as a caring friend or an interested stranger. He may not come out and say to you, this is me, but he will be there and he will be walking with you. They didn't recognize Jesus. You see, you can easily believe in something that you can see. But it takes faith to believe in something that you cannot see. There's only one way to God, and that is the way of faith. Jesus began to question him. It's been suggested that Jesus questioned him so that he'd know where they stood, but that's not true because God knows the thoughts and intents of our heart. Jesus questioned him so they would admit to themselves out loud what they truly believe. Sometimes when we hear our own words, it's very enlightening. 
Jesus exposed their true nature to them by the way that they answered his questions. He then asked them, who was this Jesus? They said, well, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. They were being complimentary, or so they thought, but their words betrayed their own testimony. They said, he was. Did you catch it? They said he was. He was in the past. He was history. He was a previous chapter in their life. He was. But Christian, if Jesus Christ is real in your life and in your testimony, he's not a was, he's an is. When Moses asked God who he should say had sent him, God said, just tell them I am. Not I was or I have been or I used to be, but I am. When you talk about your relationship with God, do you expound on history or do you talk about today? Jesus wasn't God to them. They begin to tell the story of the crucifixion, and their own words incriminated them even more. They said, we had hoped this was the one. We had hoped. That's not faith. And what is more, they said, it's the third day. And he said he would rise again on the third day. Now, I'm reading this, and I am totally baffled by this conversation. If it is the third day, and that was the day Jesus said he would rise from the grave, if there was testimony of people who had been to the grave, who said he wasn't there, and said the angels said that he was risen, then where were these two guys going? If this was the moment of truth, then where were they headed to? Why wouldn't they want to be there for the greatest moment in human history? Makes no sense. As they walked together, Jesus expounded on the word of God to them concerning himself. Only the word of God can fix your faith problem. Listening to music won't do it. Reading novels won't do it. Attending a church service won't do it. You have to open the book. It is the primacy of God's word. Only the word will change your heart. When they reached their destination, they invited Jesus to come inside with them to spend the night, still not recognizing who he was. But as they sat down to eat, Jesus began to break the bread. And as he broke the bread, the Bible says their eyes were opened. And for the first time ever, they saw Jesus for who he really was, the living Son of God. But here's the good part. When they recognized Jesus, the Bible says in verse 33 that immediately they got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. These two men thought that they were Christians, but they were never truly saved until their eyes were opened and they acknowledged Jesus as God. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One of the most vital parts of your salvation is acknowledging not that Jesus was a great prophet or a great man, but that he was God in the flesh. These two men walked seven and a half miles back to Jerusalem. They were excited. They, they, they were enthused. They were amazed. Jesus was alive. He had appeared to them. And they rushed back into the 11 others and they said, it is true. It is true. And I believe that the others looked back to them and said, yeah, we know it is, but we didn't have to walk 15 miles to figure it out. How far do you need to go before you recognize Jesus as God? How many wasted miles do you need to travel? How much energy and expense do you need to expend? Let me save you some time. Just stick around. Wait for it. Get involved. Keep doing the work. Keep fighting the fight. Keep standing by faith because God's word is true. It may not be looking good right now. Nothing may be seem to be going your way. You might think that your prayers aren't being answered and you aren't receiving what you think you ought to have. But don't walk away. Don't give up. Don't throw in a towel. Anybody can do that. But stick around because it's the third day. It's the third day. This is resurrection day. This is the big moment. The eastern sky is about to split. The angels are about to sing. The trumpet is about to blow. And you don't want to be anywhere else when it happens. We're going to serve Holy Communion. We're going to break the bread, and we're going to share the cup. As we do, I pray that your eyes will be opened and that you will be able to see Jesus as God.
You can't be saved until you do. You have to recognize that this one that we preach about and sing about and celebrate wasn't just some great hero of the faith, but he's God himself. And so today, as we, 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 we share with the bread and the cup, I, I want you to look at the elements as they're in your hands. And I want you to look at that bread and what that bread represents. It represents a body that was made of flesh and bone. God came here, and he put on a body just like we have that could feel what we feel, that could go through what we go through, so he could bear in that body the punishment that we all had coming. It was real. It was painful. God, that didn't have to feel anything ever, felt the worst pain anybody could ever feel. But the blood was divine. The body was flesh and bone, but the blood was divine. It's the blood of God. In it carries all of the chemical makeup of the child, children of God. And when that blood courses through your veins, you begin taking on the resemblance of the one that you have been born of. You begin to look like him and act like him and talk like him. You begin to feel like he felt. You begin to have a heart of compassion that he had. You're filled with his spirit. And when people look at you, they see him. We're going to bow for a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask my staff and the elders if they would come forward. We're going to serve you as you sit there. Your children are coming in right now. We'll give them time to get here with you. But I want you to seriously, seriously ask yourself, how do I think of Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? Our Father, today we are grateful, God, that your word is always pure and true. God, it's, it's men that mess it up. But God, I pray that some way you'll open our eyes, God, that we will see our true reflection, see who are, we are, we'll see our true nature, and God, see what about that nature is not like Christ. Father, I pray today as we receive these uh, sacraments, God, that, that God, they will be, they'll be real to us. God, even though they just represent a greater truth, God, that our mind and our heart will dwell on that today. And God, we'll realize how much part of our life it is and how important it is. And God, how much difference it makes in our eternity. Father, bless the elements today, those that receive them, to honor you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103, or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.